John 7, 8 to 10. Question is, was this a strategic move by Jesus when he didn't go to the feast with his brothers? Yes. He already knew what was going on, and it was a strategic move. Pretty much everything Jesus did f flowed out of his, um, well, his mission. And so he always put the mission first. And so one of the things that you can learn from Jesus in this is that when you know what your mission is, make sure that everything is filtered through that. If you've heard us teach on the new man, you know that we've talked about how everything has to be filtered through the, the new man, this new creation. Everything you hear has to be filtered through that. How does that apply to the new man, right? <clears throat> Even the Old Testament scriptures, how would that flow through the new man? We also have to look at it. How does it flow through the, the understanding of the kingdom? Everything we do is based on kingdom. We do it out of the kingdom. And because the kingdom is in us, because we're in the kingdom, then everything we do is kingdom-based. And so there are these signposts, <clears throat> sites, you might, like on, the, on a gun, you might say, like sites that allow you to line up with what you're doing so that you can know that what you're doing is right. Whenever you can line it up, it's good through the new man, doesn't violate the new man, doesn't violate kingdom understanding, uh, doesn't violate the understanding of the Great Commission, and as long as it's lined up with this, it's right, move forward. So, it's a good, uh, <clears throat> good general thing to know. Now, also, uh, Genesis eleven six, God says that if, <clears throat> as one people speaking the same language, nothing will be impossible to them. That's right. Uh, therefore, he came down, confused the languages to stop them from what they were doing. And then in uh, Zephaniah 3, 9, it says, For then I will turn to the people a new language, and uh, <clears throat> so that they may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. Is speaking in tongues that new language? Speaking in tongues is the language of the Spirit. But we also have to realize that <clears throat> in speaking in tongues, there are many languages. And so, but there's different purposes for each one. But now speaking in tongues through the baptism of the Spirit, as we know it in the infilling of the Spirit, is that perfect language that is spoken out by the Holy Spirit through you, right? To pray the perfect will of God for you. But you also have to remember that there is a perfect language. And technically in heaven, <clears throat> most of the time, um, words don't even need to be said. Because you communicate, you know, right? And so you don't have to communicate that way once you're there. Now here, we have to learn to communicate. And yeah, just as... Um, uh, you know, you can look at what happened on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 souls were added. And if you look at what happened before, and this was when they received those tongues, and if you look at what happened before, then 3,000 souls were killed or died uh, in the wilderness whenever they rebelled against God. So there is always that correlation between the old and the new. And so, yes, I do believe that the uh, speaking other tongues is what we would call the perfect language because it, uh, it accomplishes the perfect will of God, right? I'm, I can't say scripturally that that is the language. One other thing we have to remember too is that um, in uh, Mark 16, Jesus said that uh, believers shall speak with new tongues, plural, right? Not just a new tongue. <clears throat> so we have to realize that those new tongues are plural and not just one tongue, right? And there are different tongues for different purposes. And they have different tones, they have different sounds, they have different uh, emphasis, different uh, even feelings, you might say, that would go along with them. Uh, there is what some people call warring tongues that are usually very strong, very almost violent. <clears throat> then there are what is generally called maintenance tongues that actually goes into maintaining uh, the, the level of spiritual communication you have with God. All of this actually goes, we, we talk about all this in the book concerning tongues. It's all in there. So it would answer your questions there too. Uh, so, <clears throat> yes, uh, is speaking in tongues that new language? Is it something that we can practice as an ecclesia? Yeah, exactly. You can do it. Now, what you want to watch for, and this is what happens a lot of times. Uh, a lot of times I'll go to a meeting somewhere and I'll say, okay, we're going to pray in tongues as a group. Everybody, you know, get up, move around, walk around. What do you got to do? Pray in tongues. And I say, now we're going to direct it in the sense, okay, get louder, get stronger, get forceful. Now bring it down. Now bring it back up. Now pray, pray fast, move fast and let it come out fast. Slow it down because it, you are technically in charge of it, of the sound. The spirit works in conjunction with us. Now in that, as you do these different things, we've had people say, oh, this is unscriptural. 
because you know this is a meeting and not everybody's supposed to be speaking in tongues at a meeting it should be one or two and no, no no you have to understand there's a difference of the purpose we're not doing those tongues as a message we're not doing interpretation if you're going to do interpretation yes one two but let it be by interpretation let it be uh you know in, in a, a ordered manner this is not for that this is every we come together as a group but we're all individually building ourselves up in our most holy faith speaking in the holy ghost praying in the holy ghost so there's a difference of purpose um, <clears throat> what you find a lot in church is people have a certain idea and then they stick with that and then they become legalistic to it now i will tell you also this i love what leonard ravenhill said he said <clears throat> when people don't like a verse every verse Everything in the Bible people don't like, they call it legalistic. If you don't like it, it's legalistic. Because that way, you know, you can get it taken off the table. But everything isn't legalistic. Legalism is whenever I set a standard for me, but then I impose it upon you, even though technically it may not be a biblical standard that is set. All right, you understand what I mean by that? Uh, see, for me, I might set a standard for me, and it would be discipline. But if I turn around and say, now you've got to live up to this standard that I set, now that's legalism. See? Unless God said this is the standard. If God said it's a standard, it's not legalism. Right? So, all right. all right. Let's look in chapter 22, page 80. The principle of the offensive. First off, the definition is this. Seize, retain, and exploit the initiative. You, that means taking control of the situation. All right? Uh, to give you a quick example, uh, when we, first time we taught the DHT, we were in North Carolina publicly. We were in North Carolina up in Charlotte, and we'd been teaching. I taught every day for six weeks, Monday through Friday, and then usually preached at the church on Sunday. But we taught every day for usually about an hour and a half, two hours each evening. And so it lasted for six whole weeks. And then many times we would get together with, with the people afterwards and just hang out and go eat and go places. And <clears throat> they would visit where we were staying and <clears throat> we would go to different places, go, go to uh, you know, grocery stores together and pray for people together while we were shopping. We'd pray for people and just, we were around people a lot. And it was a great time. Well, <clears throat> I remember I went to a Walmart once and there was a girl actually up on a ladder <clears throat> and I noticed that her hand was withered and so when I walked over to her and I said, you know, excuse me. I said, uh, you know, I pray for people and God heals them. I'd like to pray for you. And I mean, just all of a sudden she said, oh, well, how did, how did you choose me? Did you just saw, oh, you just saw the crippled girl and decided, no, thanks. I don't need any of that. I don't need, and just turned and walked off. And I'm standing there kind of like, well, no, that, I, I, I just, I totally lost control of the situation. She took the initiative. I started, but then she took the initiative and then ended the conversation before I could retake the initiative. Now, since then, I've learned not to do that. You know, you've, I've learned how to engage a person, take the initiative, keep the initiative until I've accomplished what I'm there to do, whether it is actually get them completely healed or just minister to them and leave life with them, whatever needs to be done. But I've learned how to take initiative and keep the initiative. And, and once you lose initiative, it is hard to get it back. Many times, especially when we're talking about dealing with people, and I'm not talking about warfare per se now i'm talking about individual contact <clears throat> but you have to remember everybody comes from a different place and many times what you're saying isn't what they're hearing and they will take it in a different way many people have had their situation so long that now they identify with it to where that is who they are and when that happens it's really sad because sometimes it's really hard to be able to talk to them about that because if you mention that as though it's something wrong they're hearing you say it's something wrong with them. And they don't realize that to us, we look at it like a person with a flat tire. Change the tire, get back into life, right? You just fix it and move on. It's not, we don't attach the, the problem to the person. And we don't identify it with them. And so you have to learn how to take the initiative. And the initiative is usually uh, connected to the principle of the offensive, how to start the motion, how to move into it. This is what we teach in the DHT. We teach you how to do that, how to engage someone, how to talk to them. Uh, now, it says <clears throat> war, once declared, must be waged offensively, aggressively. The enemy must not be fended off, but smitten down. 
Now notice, faith is action, and action is everything. Because without action, you have nothing. You get that? Faith will always have an action accompanying it. The person who commits himself to continuous action in the vigorous pursuits of his goals, meaning spiritual warfare and spiritual goals, will always advance his cause above the person who delays in the hope that something will turn up. Okay? There's, as they always say, there's three kinds of people. Uh, people that, you know, make things happen. People that, that uh, watch things happen with us. And then people wonder what happened. This kind of thing. Well, <clears throat> years ago, uh, my mother was talking to a preacher down in East Texas. And he knew I was, I'd met him before. And he and I didn't see eye to eye on a lot of different things. And this is before I even got a hold of the DHT. So, you know, as you, you can imagine now, we really wouldn't see eye to eye. But it was funny because he was of those that, oh, okay, well, you know, let's pray about it. And it, well, let's just pray. Let's just, and, and he would take forever just praying. Whenever he could easily, it'd be like, <clears throat> do we want to go witnessing this weekend? Well, let's pray. You know, you know Friday night, are we going to go witnessing tomorrow? Well, I'm still praying about it. Sunday night, what are we doing? Well, I'm still praying. Well, the weekend's over. Right? You didn't miss the opportunity. Now we're talking about next weekend, right? <clears throat> and if you can't get a prayer answered that quick or you can't get an answer to your request, then move out. If God doesn't want you to do it, he can stop you. Amen? You don't just wait. You can start to move. <clears throat> and so I was always kind of moving quick. And he told my mother, he, asked, he saw my mother a while back after that. He said, how's Curry doing? How's it? Oh, he's doing this and this is going on. This is what's happened. He said, well, you know, he's always one of those people that makes things happen. And I'm like, well, I'd rather be known as that than somebody that nothing's happening with. Yeah, yeah. And so you, you will start to, <clears throat> there will be a lot of people that you will upset if you're the type of person that makes things happen. But all you have to do to, to make things happen, if you're a person of faith, you're going to make things happen. Yeah. Right? If you're a person of doubt, nothing's going to happen. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the person who, as I said, person who commits himself to continuous action, the vigorous pursuit of his goals will always advance his cause. Faster than, we could say, the person who just waits for something to show up. The common teaching concerning the leading of the Spirit is wrong, harmful, and arbitrarily enforced. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about there, I have teaching on being led by the Spirit. You can get a hold of that. <clears throat> it, uh, we go through the Scripture and show you um, <clears throat> that what the Bible says is not what is generally taught concerning being led. The essential elements of the principle of the offensive include attack, disperse, regroup, and attack again. These are the four elements of it. <clears throat> but the, the essential thing here is continually attack. Now, there is such a thing as a strategic withdrawal, right? <clears throat> and so you can even do a, an offensive withdrawal, which has to do with uh, attack by drawing, that you make the enemy think that you're retreating, he chases you, and then you catch him, right? So... That also would be part of an offensive, but it doesn't look offensive. A motto for this principle would be audacity, audacity, always audacity. All right. Meaning always take the chance, always move forward, always do something bold to step out. And people of God should be bold. OK, the Bible says that the righteous are as bold as a lion, but the wicked flee when none pursue. So the righteous should be bold, boldness. Um, I think it was Napoleon or one of them said that uh, fortune favors the bold, right? And so we need to realize, you know, not saying that Napoleon was a prophet, but, uh, you know, there were times when he said a few good things, okay? Especially in these areas. One of the things we have to remember, you take somebody like Patton, right? Patton was a great general in, in many ways, mainly because of his ego, okay? His ego pushed him to do things that a man of lesser ego wouldn't do. Now, we don't like the ego aspect, but he did some great things because of it. But the amazing thing is, and you can also find this in the Bible, there are a lot of people that God used that were not godly people. Right? And so we have to remember sometimes that God, it's amazing to me how people say, well, you know, that, that person's a heathen. They can't even hear God. Everybody's a heathen until they get saved. Right? You heard God when you were a heathen. That's why you got saved. And then you heard him calling it while you were unsaved. And yet we think that people, just because somebody isn't born again, they can't hear God. Well, if they can't hear God, then they couldn't hear the call of God to get saved. So the heathen can hear God. They just don't obey him. That's the difference. Bad part is many Christians hear God, still don't obey him. And so we need to realize that God can use people. All through the Old Testament, God used heathen kings to accomplish his will. 
And so whenever people talk about being led by the Spirit and they're questioning being led, well, if a heathen can be led under the Old Testament, how much more, how much easier should it be for you to be led? But if you don't know the will of God and the mind of God and the heart of God and the nature of God, then you're not going to be led. But if you know the nature and the heart and the mind and the will of God, guess what? You don't need to be specially led. You've already know, you already know His will. You just do His will. He that does the will. So you do the will. Now you can't do the will without being led. But what you think is being led is that you feel being led. And you think if you don't feel something that you're not being led. Many times you're being led to think a certain way. And that thinking causes you to act. Right? And so you have to learn to that it's not the, the, the question is not are you being led? The question is are you loving God and loving people? If you are you're being led. And even if you weren't being led, God's not going to hold it against you. Why? Because you're loving God and loving people. Right? But I will tell you this. You can't love God and love people and act and not be led. But the problem is most people want to feel like they're being led before they step out. And if you have to, if there's any feeling associated with being led, then you can't, well, you can't be led in faith. Because all you're doing is waiting for a feeling. And now you're looking for a feeling. Now you're being led by sight, by feeling, and not by faith. So technically being led has no feeling associated with it. Right? Now, by maintaining the initiative, the commander preserves his freedom of action and enhances the morale of his troops. When the enemy has seized the initiative through the offensive, it will limit your mobility. It will enhance the enemy's morale and make you a better target. So you must maintain initiative. That means you stay on the offensive. The principle of the offensive must be applied to both offensive and defensive actions. So even when you're being defensive, you have to be offensive in your defense. All right? I understand that. Okay? Defense never wins. You got that? You cannot win with defense. You have to win with offense. Offense means moving forward. Defense means moving back. Now, if... If you are moving back and you hit, I'm just taking from, let's just say, physical hand-to-hand -hand combat. If you are moving back and the person's coming forward and you throw a punch moving back, you are not going to hurt them. Because you are dissipating the power as you step back. The only way that you can stop their attack is to be offensive, to move in with the attack, so that even if they're moving and then you're moving, you're doubling the force. Right? That's... I know you didn't come here for this. I'm just going to throw it in anyway, right? Bruce Lee weighed about 140 pounds. And yet he knocked down six foot, five and six inch uh, body, uh, bodyguards that sometimes weighed over 300 pounds with a punch. There were times where he also, he kicked a man one time into the center of a swimming pool with one kick. And this guy was three times his size, right? Now, the reason he did that was because he was able to put all 140 pounds of his weight behind his punch or his kick. So he was hitting with 140 pounds times mass times velocity moving forward. Okay, that's, how, that's what real power is. And, it's, and so whenever he did that, now you could take a person that weighed 200 pounds, but if all they're going to hit with is their arm and their arm only weighs 12 pounds, they're only hitting with 12 pounds of power, even though they weigh as much as they do. So the key is getting all of your body weight behind your punch so that you're hitting with all that you weigh. Now, you say, well, how, what, how does that help me? <clears throat> okay. Spiritually, what that means is total commitment, 100%, putting everything you've got into it. <clears throat> it means being able to move forward and to advance. It means to know that you cannot win backing up. You can't win defensively. You have to go on the offense. You know, you start to feel sick. You wake up in the morning, things just don't feel right. You don't really feel sick. You just don't feel right. What do you do? Do you wait till it settles in so you can find out what it is? You know, do you run to the doctor so you can find out what, how to pray? You know, that's what everybody always says. Well, I'm just going to the doctor so I can find out what to pray against. No, you ain't. If they give you a cure, you're going to take it. Don't lie. Right? So, do you, what do you do? The, the key is, as soon as you feel different, you attack. Whatever it is. You, well, something ain't right. Attack. Well, do you know what it is? No, just attack. Pray for somebody. Now, maybe, maybe you know, you think, well, this could be contagious. Then don't go out and pray for them. Call them. 
right? Call somebody, pray for somebody, do something, attack. You don't even have to think. <clears throat> it, it's just an automatic response. You feel the enemy tries to hit you, you hit. He moves on you, you hit. You don't back up, you don't retreat, you don't commit, no. Listen, we have to realize that we are with God. The greater one is in us. He, he doesn't say that he, he might not hit at you. But know this, even if he does hit at you, you can take it and you can still win. Do you get that? But you're not going to win by running unless you're running at your opponent. You have to get this in you. You have to get into you the idea of nothing's going to stop me. Nothing, you know, you're going to have to kill me to stop me. And you can't do that because I hadn't finished what I'm supposed to be here to do yet. Right. And then you have it in you. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to attack. I'm not going to stop. See, that's what Paul had in him. He would not stop. He kept moving forward no matter what. Shipwrecks, stonings, I mean, you name it. He, 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 did st he kept preaching. After you know, the first time, most people would have quit. But he kept going. Why? And, and to do what? To preach the gospel. He said, well, yeah, that was great Apostle Paul. So what? You're supposed to be the great Apostle Bill. You know, who cares? Paul was no different than anybody else. He even said, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Isn't that right? So we have to understand... That who we have in us is what makes us strong. This is not strong. The only thing you bring to the table is the grit to keep moving forward. And even that you get from God. And the more time you spend with him, the more of that you will have. Because, listen, people will fight to the death for love more often than they will fight to the death because they fear. And so we have to realize when you love God enough that you'll keep on going rather than, well, I got to go or God's going to get me. No, that's not going to work. That, that wears off after a while, that, that fear aspect. You have to have it in you that I love him so much that he died for me and I will live and die for him if necessary. And then when you get that in you, it doesn't matter what the enemy throws at you. Then it gets to be almost a, uh, almost a game. You're like, go ahead. You, know? you, you start being like Rocky. You know? you, go ahead. Hit me with your best shot. Take it. Go ahead. I can take it. I'll show you I can take your best shot. And you just keep moving forward. So, all right. <clears throat> the principle of the offensive must be applied to both offensive and defensive actions. An offensive attitude must be maintained in defensive operations because prolonged and passive defense breeds unrest, lowers morale, and surrenders the advantages of intangibles to the enemy. Now, that's, this is both in individual combat but also in, in corporate. When, when a church settles down, quits making advances, quit stretching, quit reaching out in new faith projects, it will start to die because people get bored. And when people get bored, when Christians get bored, they get into sin. Mm -hmm. Boredom kills more Christians because it leads them into sin. And so you should always be on the edge. Whenever you have to trust God for everything, you tend to stay pretty tight with God. You start to move forward more often and you've got a faith project and you know, well, I'm not going to sin because I'm going to stay tight with God because we're doing this thing. We're feeding the hungry. You know, we're, we're taking care of orphans. I, I'm not going to be stupid and do something stupid that's going to lessen my faith. I'm going to do what it takes to build my faith. You know, then you sit down in front of the TV and some stupid show comes on and, and you, you think, well, you know, I'm just going to sit here and veg out. No, you're not. You're not just vegging out. You are unrenewing your mind. Get up and turn that thing off. Turn to do something. Go do something that'll be productive. Everything is, there's nothing neutral. Right? It's called amusement for, for a reason. Um, to muse means to think. A before it means not. So it literally means not to think. That's what amusement is. You don't have to think. And yet God tells us to be sober-minded. To have the mind of Christ. To think on these things. He didn't tell us to be amused. He told us to be productive. <clears throat> so, here he says, uh, An active defense conducted in an offensive manner keeps the enemy off balance, restricts his ability to attack, and enhances security. Any leader adhering to the principle offensive sets the pace and determines the course of battle, exploits enemy weakness, and is better prepared to capitalize on unexpected developments because they're already in motion. All right, let's say it another way. It's easier for God to lead you if you're already moving. A whole lot harder to turn, you know, a, a parked car than it is a car that's moving. <clears throat> so, 
Courage is essential to success in all activities that call for risk and daring. The most essential qualities of a general will always be, first, a high moral courage, capable of great resolution. Second, a physical courage, which takes no account of danger. Courage is resistance to fear, mastery of fear, not absence of fear. That's Mark Twain. Winston Churchill said, Courage is rightly considered the foremost of virtues because upon it all others depend. Courage. You have to have moral courage. You have to have uh, courage in every area of your life to be able to stand against the enemy. And another word for courage is faith. <clears throat> Here's how the enemy uses it. The enemy's plan is to use the principle of offensive to keep you retreating or cowering. It is designed to keep you thinking defensively rather than offensively. It is designed to keep you praying for yourself. Keep your mind on yourself rather than to pray for others and think outwardly. And he also tries to keep you defensive by always trying to get you to think, Oh, Jesus, just come get me out of here. Just come get me out of here. When you ought to be thinking, hold off, Jesus, don't come yet. There's people that still are not saved. There's still people that need to be healed. There's still people that need to know you. <clears throat> it is since the essence of the offense is to attack, attack, attack. Any plans using this principle will seem to be wave after wave. Most people, okay, when you find a person that is functioning in this area, what you will find is they are constantly moving forward. And before you can even truly, um, how can I say, <clears throat> go through the benefits of what you've just encountered, they're already moving to the next one. Why? Because all they know is move forward, advance, attack, constantly attack, constantly take ground. Most people want to take ground, build something there, and stay there. Instead, it's take the ground, move forward. Take the ground, move forward. And so we have to, you, you will see people that have this uh, in them, that whatever they're talking about today, tomorrow it's like, okay, let's get that done. Why? Because we got to do this tomorrow. And tomorrow it'll be something else. It's, and, and the sad part is, the negative side, it seems as though they're never satisfied. But the fact is, they are satisfied as long as they are moving forward. They're not satisfied with being stagnant. <clears throat> so, these can be coordinated attacks using sickness, lack of finances. This is how the enemy uses this. And as we say, you know, it's just one thing after another. Man, if it wasn't for this, and if it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. Remember that old saying? Well, that's the way the enemy comes in, wave after wave after wave. But we can use the same principle against him. Constant forward movement. A moving target is harder to hit. Amen? A whole lot harder for the devil to hit you with sickness when you're constantly moving out and going and praying for people. Why? Because you've got health built into you. Amen. You're thinking healing. You're thinking life. You're not thinking, you know, sit in your house and, well, if I go out there, somebody's going to sneeze on me and I'm going to get sick. Okay? So, the enemy's use here, the enemy's usage of this principle in corporate warfare may come in two basic forms. Number one, internal attacks. Small fires kindled within the church, such as divisions, arguments, cliques, doctrinal issues, program disagreements, financial questions, external attacks, city ordinances preventing witnessing or meetings, arbitrary building code enforcement, attacks from other Christian groups, and then you always got witches and stuff like that going on, right? <clears throat> now, so these are internal and external attacks. The Christian's use, the Christian must learn to use the principle of offensive, also known as continuous attack. The first step is to learn to develop an aggressive attitude against all the works of the enemy. Find out what is wrong and attack. The second step is to learn to immediately attack as soon as an enemy is spotted. Don't wait to find out if it's anything serious. Don't wait to find out what it is. Attack the attack. One of the things that most people don't realize, if someone, see, you don't have to get in. Okay. Again, relating this back to hand-to-hand -hand combat. You don't have to get in close to hit somebody. Right? You can stay at arm's length. And when they throw a punch, punch their punch. Yeah. And not like that. Okay? But if they throw out a punch, you, you've got all of this distance. You can hit anywhere along the line. Well, how does that apply to spiritual warfare? When the enemy throws a punch at you, don't necessarily hit him. Now, you want to go after him, but you can also stop the attack. Your shield of faith quenches the fiery darts. You have a shield. He has darts. The darts are not him. But your shield can stop his darts. You hear that? That is you attacking the attack. So he throws something at you, you hit what he throws at you. Go at it. Somebody says something bad about you, climb on top of it and use it to preach from. 
Amen? What does that mean? Well, they say this. All right, well, here's what we're going to do. You let them say that. And you don't let it bother you. You don't turn around and attack back. You let them say what they want. And then you start preaching on that stuff. Right? You know, there are people that says, I'm like this. Well, if I was like this, this is what I would have done. But I'm not like this because this is what I did do. And here's what the Bible says. Here, and then you, you, as I said, you climb on top of it and preach off of it. Now, if you're guilty of it, repent. And then preach off of it. Amen? But you have to realize, the hit, attack the attack. Not the person. We don't, and, and you can attack the enemy, but don't attack the person. So, <clears throat> next one. This is the Christian's use here of the principle of offensive and corporate warfare. Christians use this principle to continuously attack sickness, disease, and, any, and this is mainly through anybody that would request prayer. So you're constantly going after these things. You practice it. You get used to it. You make it normal for you. Go to the hospital. Go to the emergency room. Just go in there and sit down next to a person and start talking to them. Ah, what are you in here for? You know, then go to the waiting room. You can go to the waiting room anytime. There'll be people sitting in there just about. You don't have to be sick to go in the waiting room. Just go in there and sit. Sit down next to somebody. They don't know if you're there waiting on somebody or not. Just go in and sit down and start talking to them. Hey, what are you, what are you here for? What's, what's going on with you? Well, is this thing I'm waiting for someone? You know, my, you know, my son, my daughter's in there getting checked on this. Okay. Well, you know, I pray for people. Can I pray for your son or your daughter? Yeah, okay. Most people will let you pray for them to some degree. And so you can start to attack these things and start to work with them. And so, but the key is you have to get used to that. You can't, oh, well, maybe. Okay, you can't, you cannot have that timidity. You have to be, you have to know what you're talking about. It's not that hard. Get a hold of the DHT, go through it, study it, practice it. Know what you're talking about. Develop that surety that you're right. And when you know you're right, don't back down. Speak it out. Who are they? Well, you know, I don't want to offend anybody. Why are you worried about that? The only people that's going to get offended is somebody that doesn't like God. Why are you worried about offending them? You know, well, you know, I just don't think it's right to push my religion on somebody. They don't pay your rent. Don't worry about them. Right? Do what you're supposed to do. You ought to concern yourself more with pleasing God than you are offending somebody else. So, next one, chapter 23. <clears throat> the principle of the economy of force. This means you focus the right amount of force on the key objective without wasting force on secondary objectives. Again, this goes back to uh, the objective and to mass. In other words, you want to put all your force toward what counts and not waste it on things that don't. So that means you have to know what counts. You have to know the one thing that counts and constantly be going back to that. What, what are we doing and why are we doing it? And making sure that it's right. <clears throat> Always remember, General Patton said, it's better to waste ammunition than lives. Listen, dollars come and go. Don't make decisions based on dollars. Make decisions based on the will of God. When you make decisions based on the will of God, whatever dollars you need will be there to do the will of God. I mean, I, I told my daughter early on, because uh, she was engaged actually twice before she actually got engaged a third time and actually married her, her husband. And especially the second time, I, I told her, this was like two weeks before she was supposed to get married. <clears throat> Not to the man she's married to now, but this is the second time, and I, I knew it. I knew he wasn't right for her. <clears throat> and so I told her, I said, "Listen, if there is any hesitation in you, if there's any question in you that this isn't right, call it off. Don't don't even hesitate." And she said, "But you know, yeah, I know, Dad. But you know, we, we've we've got the venue, we've got I got the dress, we got all the stuff, and the money you've spent toward it." I'm like, "Look, money comes and goes, but a bad marriage can ruin your life." I said, "Don't worry about that stuff." You know, save the dress, use it next time. She did that. She called off the wedding. It's a good thing, right? And then she met and married uh, the man she's married to now, and amazing person. Good for her, okay? I mean, she did good. And, and so the whole idea is that you don't make decisions based on money. You make decisions based on the will of God. When you make decisions based on the will of God, the money will be there to do what you need to do. If you got the faith for it, it'll work. If you, that, that's why, I'm, if you don't have the faith, to bring in what you need finance-wise to get things done, then you ain't got the faith to do the thing with the money you bring in. The fact that you can believe God for the money, the money shows up, proves you got the faith to actually do the thing that God has called you to do with the money that he brought in for you. Does that make sense? If you, in other words, if you can't get the money to do it, you ain't got the faith to do it. All right? Just remember that. 
Actually, that's T.L. Osborne. Okay, that's, that, that's where I got that from. So, that and Dr. Summerall, that's kind of a mixture. <clears throat> Use what you have the most of to start to soften the enemy. Save the more valuable for the more valuable target. Right? <clears throat> you, you, don't, um, <laughs> you don't use a hand grenade in a phone booth. Right? Uh, you'll kill yourself. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> See, people say, what weapon is the best weapon? Depends on the circumstances. If you're in a phone booth, it's probably going to be a knife. Right? Uh, if you're at a distance, it might be a gun. If it's at a good enough distance, it might be a hand grenade. So you can't just say, this is the best weapon. The good thing is, as Christians, we know what our best weapon is. Name of Jesus. Always good. It won't hurt you. Amen? So, but the key is, don't use, don't put your focus on things that don't matter. Put your focus on what matters. Economy of force. Don't use more energy towards something than you need to do. Let me put, okay, let's just be blunt. Don't put more time into people that is not going to pay off for the kingdom. You got that? Don't waste time on people that it's not going to pay off for the kingdom. Now listen, the corollary of that is this. The people you think it's not going to pay off on may not be the people that, they may not be the type of people you think they are. When we did DBI, uh, there was a particular young man that came to DBI. And it's funny because we dealt with a lot of people. I've seen people come and go. And whenever he showed up, I remember looking at him and thinking, he is not going to last. Right? And I, it's so funny because I looked at him and I thought, he, just based on how he presented himself, I was thinking, this guy is so full of himself, I guarantee you. Uh, dying to self ain't on his agenda, and when I preach that, he ain't going to stay around. He now leads our German <laughs> division of the ministry and oversees it, and has traveled all over the world and has been with me in several different countries and does a great job. Amazing young man. I was absolutely wrong, right? And I'm glad I didn't chase him off, okay? <laughs> So you can be wrong, but the main thing is, and, and you can look, look what Elijah did to Elisha. You know, Elijah comes by, throws his mantle, his cape, whatever, over on Elisha and then walks off. And then Elisha does all this stuff and runs up to him and says, hey, wait, wait, let me go, let me go say bye, let me do all this stuff. And Elijah turns and says, what have I got to do with you? Well, you just threw your mantle over on him, but only because God told him. You could tell Elijah didn't want to do that. God told him to do it and he was obedient and that's it. He's kind of like, here it is. You want it? Take it. And he, and he said, okay, uh, what do you want? He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. Notice he didn't say, I want a double anointing. He didn't say, I want a double portion of anointing. He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. I want to be twice the man of God you are. That's what he was saying. And then Elijah tells him, well, if you see me when I go, you'll get what you ask for. And then he spent the rest of his time with him trying to tell him, you go over there. I'm going over here. He kept trying to get rid of him. And every time Elisha says, no, I'm not going. Because if I go, sure as the world, as soon as, we, as soon as we part company, God will take you and I won't get what I want. So he even became disobedient to Elijah and said, no, I'm not leaving you. And Elijah kept saying, get out of here. Go on, go on over there. I'll go over here. No, ain't going to happen. I want what I'm coming for. I want that double portion of your spirit. And ended up getting it. Why? Because he wouldn't be dissuaded. But Elijah wasn't the easiest person to be around. It's funny because there are people that I'm very tender toward. Help them, talk to them, that kind of thing. Then there's other people, I'll be honest with you, I'm somewhat cold toward them. I don't like it. And I wonder sometimes, why am I that way? Why, why, you know, this person, you know, they seem to be trying, they're, you know, doing it. Why aren't I more open to that person? Why don't I bring them in closer? And, you know, what's going on? Why is there this thing? It's not that I don't like them. It's just not close to them. And then later on you find out it's usually one of two reasons. They were a Judas. Or they needed that to almost like that rubber band effect where you keep them at arm's length and it makes them push in. And then you get to find out which one of those two they are. Whether they are going to push in and be Elisha or they're going to slink off and be a Judas. And see, and then the whole time you're thinking, God, why am I that way? See, here, okay, I'm going to tell you something you're not going to like. God doesn't answer to you. God, do you realize God gets to choose who he wants to? See, I don't like that. You don't get to choose your deliverer. The people of Israel, 
the, the Hebrew children, you know what they did? They told Moses, leave us alone. And Moses said, no, God sent me. I come here to free you. And then he frees them. And all the way along the way, they're all saying, why didn't you just leave us in Egypt? All along the way. And he's leading them out of bondage. And they're all arguing with him, saying, wasn't it enough that we, weren't there enough graves in Egypt? Why you bring us out here? At least there we had food. And yet they never went without, without a meal. And it was miraculous. Pheasants. You know, all these things going on. Manna coming from everywhere. And yet every time they turn around, as soon as it wasn't the way they wanted it, why didn't you just leave us in, in, in Egypt? Why didn't you let us die there? And I'm sure Moses was saying the same thing. Why didn't I? You know? I mean, it's amazing. And then finally God says, stand back, Moses. I'm going to kill them all and start all over again with somebody else. Just me and you, we're going to do this thing. I'm just going to kill them all. And Moses stands up and says, no, you're not. You're not going to do that because the Egyptians will hear and all the other people will hear and they'll think you brought them out here to kill them and they're going to say that you can't keep your promise. That's God, ta Moses talking to God. And read it. It said God repented. Wow. Now think about that. See, but there's things people don't like. The Israelites didn't choose their deliverer. God chose their deliverer. You don't get to choose your deliverer. Right? I guarantee there's probably somebody in this room that does not like me. And yet they keep coming back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I'm good with that. I don't care either way. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Right. So, but it's funny because there was a person one time that the sound of their voice just got on my nerves. I mean, I, I, I hated to hear the sound of their voice. I'll be honest with you, it was, a, it was a woman preacher. It's not who you think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Okay. But it was a woman preacher. And her voice just got on my nerves. I mean, I, I mean if, if, anytime I heard her voice, if I could, I turned it off. I didn't care. I turned it off. And then I started studying this certain area and I'm reading it. And I just, I got a, I got a block there. I couldn't, couldn't get an answer. I'm praying, not hearing an answer. And I'm like, God, what is this? Why, what, what's the answer here? And he said, he said her name. He said, she's got your answer. And I'm like, well, I'm not sure I really need that answer. I could get by, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> cause I didn't want to listen to her. Right. <clears throat> but I knew that if I was going to get that answer, that's what I had to do. Why? Why? Other people had the answer. I didn't know who had it or I'd have went to somebody else. But other people had it. But God pointed her out. Why? Because he wanted to break that thing in my flesh. That I thought that I could determine what my, who my deliverer was or who, who brought me that truth. We have to realize God determines your deliverer. God, see, we like this democratic thing about God. Well, God is not a respecter of persons. You know, he'll bless everybody equally. He's, he's good to everybody equally. All that is true. But guess what? God still reserves the right to call who he will, to choose who he will to do particular jobs. Yes. He reserves that right. Right. You, you can't just be what you want to be. Now, God made you in a way that whenever you do what he called you to do, you will be very fulfilled in doing it. But many times people run into problems when they try to be something that God never wanted them to be. And they end up, William Branham, prime example. William Branham had a gift, an amazing gift. Hundreds, literally thousands of times, never missed any detail in a word of knowledge. Thousands of times. And yet he liked to teach. And he was horrible at it. And Gordon Lindsay told him, stick with your gift. Let Brother Bosworth, F.F. Bosworth, they travel together. Let him teach. Don't teach. And, and Brown said, I love to teach. I want to teach. He goes, it doesn't matter what you love. You're not good at it. You have Napoleon fighting Hitler when you talk about history. You don't know what you're talking about. <clears throat> <clears throat> and, and Gordon said, you can't, you can't do that. And he said, just stay with your gift. And so William Branham did what most would do. He fired Gordon Lindsay. And surrounded himself with two people and said, oh, William Brown, you're great. You're the prophet. You're the guy. And he started and he kept teaching and he got weirder and weirder and weirder in his doctrine. And then and yet the gift still operated. But then he died in 1965, just before Christmas. Hit head on in an auto accident coming out of uh, Arizona and coming in near Amarillo, Texas. Got hit head on 
with, uh, two, with a car full of, uh, well, the driver was drunk, put it that way. <clears throat> and he went across the line, hit them head on. And William Branham uh, died just a couple of days later than that in the, in the hospital. His, his wife, uh, Billy Paul, his son, was ahead of him in another car, saw him go by and said, I'm going to go back and check on them because they're not here yet. They ought to be here. He went back and found the car crash. <clears throat> and his Branham was thrown through the windshield, mangled, uh, horrible. And, and his wife uh, was in the car seat. She was underneath the front dash. She was dead. His daughter was in the back seat, hurt very bad. And when Billy Paul got back there, William was still alive. And he said, uh, you know, he's trying to help him, but he's so messed up. He knew he wasn't going to live long. And William Brown said, uh, how's mother? And he looked over and he said, Dad, she, she's dead. And he said, well, I, I can't move my arm. Put my hand on her. And Billy Paul took his hand and put it on his wife. And she came back alive. And so then the ambulance, ambulances came. They took him to the hospital and uh, put him in the hospital, and then he died just a couple of days before Christmas. <clears throat> and now, he wasn't anywhere near the age of death, but, and this is not God removing him because of some wrong teaching, which is what some people tried to say. But let me tell you, when you get off, you get in a dangerous place. Not that God will remove you, but you get into a place where you don't have the protection of God because you're not believing right. And he died younger than he should have. He, he should have lived many more years. He should. And at his funeral, it's amazing. I've got a, I've got a um, uh, recording of his funeral. And F.F. F. Bosworth spoke. T.L. Osborne spoke. Gordon Lindsay. Everybody spoke. I mean, it was a who's who at his funeral. Thousands of people showed up. Because he was so accurate in the word of knowledge. And yet so messed up in doctrine. Stay in the area where you're gifted of God. You can stretch. You should see in stretch, but you've got to do it under the guidance of someone who can help tell you the truth so that you don't get out and get weird on stuff. That's why it's important that you work with a team, that you have people connected, that you have people that will tell you the truth. And see, William Branham, he, he got away from people that are telling the truth. He got around, he had people surround him. There was a bunch of yes men and just told him what he wanted to hear rather than saying, let's, let's do this. So, <clears throat> resources or anything that you need to use in your war. We're going to go through this a little bit later, but we're going to take a break now because I've already went a few minutes over, so we will take the break now and come back. We will pick this back up then. Amen. Y'all get anything out of this? Yes. All right, it's because, uh, you know, I, I know we're moving through these quickly, but at the same time, I don't want to just read the principles to you. I want you to start to see and start to spot the principles and the patterns so that you can use these in actual life. I don't want this to just be doctrinal to you. I want you to be able to practice it and to see how the enemy tries to work against you and how you can overcome him. Amen? Otherwise, we're just wasting our time. And so we want to be able to use these things. Amen? Take a quick break and we will be back momentarily. If you are considering partnering with us and would like to support our mission, please visit jglm.org forward slash partners. Proceeds will go toward the cost of the television broadcast and our mission work around the world.